And let me get my slides up and we'll get started. Okay. So you should be able to see my slides at this point. If you can't, just unmute and give me a holler and I'll see what I can do. So this is for school staff and health department staff. These will be able to be online. It will be public. Available to the public and make sure all this information gets down to the record. I would not touch that sucker. <laughs> so, a new epidemic order kind of snuck out on us yesterday and is effective as of today through the end of this month. Um, there are some provisions that are pretty important to you at the school level. One is, um, well, I'll get to them in a minute, but if you go to the michigan.gov slash coronavirus website under the resources tab and the state orders and directives, you'll find the order. And there are um, the following kind of cheat sheets that help you navigate things a little bit easier. Um, they also updated the end of year event guidance, so the prom and graduation guidance to reflect the changes that impact it. And that's under the resources tab again, but in the K through 12 school opening guidance. I just realized that there. Um, so the main changes that impact the schools, masks are not required at outdoor gatherings um, unless there's more than 100 individuals. So as you have like baseball games or softball games, if the crowd is less than 100 individuals, those individuals do not necessarily have to wear masks. Um, at non-contact sporting events that are played outdoors, so track, baseball, softball, when they're actively playing in practice or in a competition, they don't have to wear a mask. But if they're sitting in the dugout, you know, if they're having a team meeting, things that are not active participation or play, they do need to wear a mask. Um, other things that are different are listed here. It has mainly to do with some capacity gathering limits, um, which don't necessarily affect you at the schools. There are some changes to the outdoor stadium seating. Um, but mainly if you have capacities of 5,000 or 10,000 or more, um, which may affect some of you, but you can read through all of those. Oh, the other big one, I almost forgot this. Um, one of the biggest ones too, is it in fully vaccinated athletes. So that's two weeks or more past their last vaccine. Um, so the second dose they do not need to undergo any more routine testing. Obviously though, if they have symptoms, they still need to stay home and get tested, but the routine asymptomatic screening no longer needs to occur in fully vaccinated athletes, and it doesn't need to occur, and it never did need to occur in those who had previously been diagnosed with COVID for three months after yes. their infection. So let me pull up our data here. Okay, so things continue to improve. We're still a lot higher than we were back in February, but we're, we're improving still. Um, the daily cases per million for Michigan are down to 345. Uh, they were 463 and the percent positivity is down another point to 12.1%. The six counties in Central Michigan District Health Department are at 371. Um, so just a little above the state average, but down from 451 last week. And our percent positivity is at 13%, down from 14% last week. Um, District Health Department 10 is at 307 on average, um, down from 392 last week, and 13.7% positivity down from 15%. Um, as you can see, you know, a lot of foot or a lot of um, variability. Um, Crawford's actually come down quite a bit. Nuego County is still pretty high. 
um, but everybody is coming down. Um, the three counties of Mid Michigan District Health Department on average is at 392. Last week they were at 429 per million and the percent positivity is at 12 and a half. Last week it was 14.4%. So again, still quite a bit higher than we were a couple of months ago, but we are still moving in the right direction. Looking at data from the state as a whole, again, <clears throat> percent positivity is down 11% and case rates are down 30% um, from the peak in April. Um, but we're still, you know, one of the highest in the, in the country right now. Um, luckily, our inpatient bed occupancy with COVID patients has decreased, um, but we're still one of the highest in the country still for that as well. And our um, deaths have increased since we were at our low in March. Um, but hopefully that trend will improve as now our cases and hospitalizations have improved. Um, this I've shown this image before. This just kind of showed Michigan here that, yeah, we were increasing, but we were still below some of our neighboring states. Unfortunately, now our total case count of COVID does now exceed um, Pennsylvania and Ohio. So unfortunately, Michigan um, has surpassed those other states in cumulative cases um, per 100,000 people. So that's as a rate, not per, not total number, um, because some of these states, you know, have very different populations. So, so unfortunately, we're no longer the the leader in the area of keeping cases down. Our state positivity trends um, continue to drop. You know, again, we're still higher than we used to be, but continue to drop down. Um, so again, it's a a good reassuring trend that we're seeing there. <clears throat> um, our ages, I know this is a little bit confusing to look at at first, but I just blew up this last bit of the curve. These are not rates, these are the absolute number of cases per each age group. <clears throat> this 10 through 19 year olds have had the highest new cases. No, I'm sorry, this is per million population, I'm so sorry. Um, this 10 through 19 year old age group has had the highest um, new cases every week for several weeks now. Um, and then it's 20 to 29 year olds, 30 to 39 year olds, you know, and so on. So it is still the same pattern of really affecting younger people right now. Um, this changed this week down here. It's hard to see, but right here you can see the zero to nine year old age range has a higher incidence of new cases above the 60 to 69 year olds. Um, so they took over the lead this week. Um, so again, our school age kids are having a lot of cases. So um, the variants are definitely our predominant uh, they're not strains necessarily, but are definitely the predominant type of virus that we're finding. Of all the, the virus that's being typed in the country, um, just about 60% of them are the B117 variant. Um, as you can see, the next two top most common are um, variants of concern or variants of interest. So definitely the prevalent, most prevalent variants are variants of concern. And in Michigan, um, almost 70% of what we're testing in the lab end up being B117. Um, so it's it's definitely, odds are if you get sick with COVID, it's going to be B117 or one of the other variants. So it's just kind of the reality. I took out the next slide. I was showing kind of week to week comparisons. Um, I took that slide out because it's just getting so busy and it basically just is what it is at this point. Um, so our hospitalization trends continue to come down, um, starting to hit a little bit of a, of a leveling here, but that is so tiny. I'm not going to read anything into that, but um, we do continue to drop down, which is is good. So we're going to hope that that trend continues. Um, I know our hospital employees are hoping for that too, because they were 
hitting the limit there. Um, our lab turnaround time, the last few weeks, this uh, turnaround for the commercial labs is right around two days. So that has greatly improved. And this was around 0.9, our hospital turnaround. So um, our turnaround time for lab testing has actually improved. Um, so getting test results back should not be an issue in um, making decisions or things that should be pretty quick for you. And, you know, as we know, we have more and more rapid testing available in our communities. Um, there were 73 new um, school-related outbreaks statewide. Um, and, um, you know, some of these were traditionally a lot, a lot higher numbers in the past several weeks. So seems to be that the number of outbreaks we're seeing in the state are settling down a bit. In the schools actually statewide, the number of high school and middle school outbreaks went down, but the elementary school setting actually saw um, the biggest increase in new outbreaks. In our 19 counties, um, wherever you may be, um, we're pretty stable. Uh, we've we have seen six new outbreaks, five in the high school setting and one in the junior high setting. Um, but we have 28 ongoing outbreaks, which just means that it's still within 28 days um, of that outbreak, whether or not they're still getting new cases. Um, last week, there were 29 ongoing outbreaks. So, so we are seeing some new outbreaks. They're not a huge number of cases each. And um, again, still, still waiting for some of those old outbreaks um, to resolve. So that's all I have for official slides. Um, I wanted to just kind of open up to questions. I have some other information available if we need it, um, but I will open it up to questions here first. Let me get to, so go ahead and put any questions you may have in the chat area. And then at the end, um, I will open it up to the phone line. Um, for those who may not have access to their computer. All right, let me, I just wanna make sure I'm at the very beginning. Okay. If two elementary classes play kickball or any other non-contact game outside, can they be mask free? I would say yes, while they're playing outside, um, you know, while they're doing anything athletic, they can. Um, obviously, you'll want to try to keep them distanced as much as possible. Um, but that is how I would interpret that. Um, there is an email for the state through the state, the sports testing. You can email them and clarify that with them. Um, but I would, I would interpret it as yes, you can. If two teachers are two week post vaccine, do they need to continue to wear a mask to teach? So yes, um, with the masking rules, one thing to remember is, you know, we still have the myosha order and we still have, um, we still have the epidemic order, which really requires masking in group settings. Um, the guidance to not wear a mask if you're fully vaccinated is really in your private residence with other private individuals. So in public at this point, we still have to mask. Um, I know the question will come up regarding vaccination status of athletes to avoid testing. Can we take their word or do they have to verify seeing their vaccination card? Um, I actually do not know the answer to that one. And so again, I would email the state if you go into the um, the testing area of the state website. I think it's MDHHS dash sports testing, something or other. So they have an email address. If you need it, I can find it. Um, you can just email me and I'll find it and send it to you. But they do have an email you can send questions to. Um, and I know that they have calls for question and answers, I think once a week, I think they call it office hours. But I honestly don't know the, the, quest, the answer to that one. Um, is there any guidance provided in the athletic update 
related to school-sponsored indoor summer camps such as, no, there isn't, um, sorry if, if you can't see the thing, it says um, indoor summer camps such as basketball and volleyball. Um, not that I saw, um, Laura does have guidance for camps and there is guidance online about camps. Um, but if it's a school sponsored event, I'm assuming, and it's athletic, I'm assuming you would need to follow the same guidance that you are following for your school sports. Again, those kinds of questions, direct those towards that state email address. Um, one, because they're going to know the right answer, and two, they then put those questions, they have a frequently asked question document, and that, you know, if you have those questions, likelihood other schools have those questions, and, you know, that can help everybody out that way. What is the CT threshold for testing cycles in our state? I've read that anything above 25 in a large part detecting dead virus, and could this be affecting our inflated rates? So we know that Anyone who's tested positive before can test positive due to dead virus or just persistent RNA um, for a long time. And so we don't, if someone's been positive before, we don't look at those. Um, there's a lot of controversy about the CT threshold. Really, you have to call each individual lab to find out what tests they're using and what the threshold is for that. And many of those labs don't know that because it's not really felt to be, uh, it's debated how useful that indicator is. So that's about the best answer I have for that one. Does the percent vaccination include vaccinations received out of state for Michigan residents? Those that go south for the winter are receiving vaccines. So if someone received their vaccine in Florida, while they're being a snowbird and they come back to Michigan, they can call us or their primary care provider. Um, they can provide us with proof of their vaccination and we can enter it into the state registry so that then their vaccination is counted toward the percent of fully vaccinated individuals living in Michigan. If they're vaccinated in some states that there are some states that share their records with us, but then there's some like Florida who would not. And so again, they can, and I know this has been publicized in some media channels, but if they provide proof of vaccination to us, we will enter it into the state registry. Um, we are anticipating changes in quarantine guidance um, six foot to three foot and quarantine length. Um, oh, are we anticipating changes in quarantine guidance and quarantine length like um, Ionia County just released? So that was some of the information I had um, prepared. So we are fully aware and we're equally frustrated with the um, variations between guidance between different health departments. Um, we recently switched our quarantine guidance from 14 days to 10 days, primarily because the majority of counties around us had switched to 10 days and we wanted to make it as consistent as possible. Um, I'm actually gonna share my slides again because I did prepare some information here to try to make this easier to discuss because I know you guys are getting a lot of questions on this. Um, so this is kind of wordy, but for quarantine, we are again allowing release from quarantine at 10 days. That's as long as those individuals, you are comfortable in knowing that they will continue to monitor themselves and be very careful with their activities for those additional four days, because there is an increased risk that they can transmit disease in those four extra days. Um, it's about 7%. It can range between two and 20%. That's based on a more recent study. It has to do with household contacts, which we know their risk of infection is usually higher, um, but it's not zero. The only way to really keep it as close to zero as possible is to quarantine people for 14 days. So to go to 10 days, we really need to make sure people realize there is still some risk there, so they have to watch themselves. Um, we, do not, and by we, I mean the three health departments, 
worth of counties on this call, the 19 counties that are invited to this call, um, and the state of Michigan to date do not support a seven day quarantine with negative testing because even if you test negative and you come out of quarantine at seven days, there's a 19% risk on average, ranging from 10 to 30% risk that once you come out at seven days, even testing negative, you can still go on to become contagious, infectious, positive after that. So meaning about one in five are gonna go on to become contagious after that seven days. That is an unacceptably high risk to us. So that is why we are not promoting or advocating or recommending that. Um, so in terms of quarantine, again, this week we did send out communication, hopefully to all of you, that as of Wednesday or yesterday, we did go back to the 10 day quarantine um, again, primarily to make it easier for all of you because we know there was a lot of pressure and we know that all the, mainly all the counties around us that border us and share school districts with us um, were going to 10 days as well. Um, is it safest to stay at 14 days? It sure is, but is it gonna happen? It's difficult. The three feet question. We were considering using three feet as the definition of a closed contact for the K through eight grades prior to this recent spike. Once that big spike happened, we, we paused that decision-making because it, we're not, because there are so many cases and so much spread and to become, to be more lenient was just not a good idea at the time. Our cases are still very high. We have a lot of variant cases and they are just more transmissible. Um, the K or the 10 through 19 year olds have had the highest rates for several weeks. And then again, as I mentioned this week, our nine and below age group jumped up above um, older individuals in terms of case rates. There have been, and I know people might argue, well, it's only six kids. Well, still, we've had six new cases of the MISC reported in Michigan in just the first few, or sorry, the last few weeks since the surge has happened. And it's, that's usually delayed a few weeks from when um, they get sick. So we've held off for all those reasons. We're still holding off on making that change because we don't want to take four steps back after just taking one step forward. We'd like to hold off. So we, but we continue to consider it. We continue to watch the data. We continue to consult with the state experts and other experts on this. Um, so those requests are being looked at. Um, so I just, you know, I just wanted to share that with all of you. Um, wondering about the 12 and up vaccine, when and how can we promote its use? Worried about lack of participation due to parental concerns. So we're very hopeful that Pfizer vaccine will be approved for the ages of 12 and up sometime next week. Um, you know, there's some parents like myself, of course, I'm, you know, maybe I don't count, but that are really excited to get our kids vaccinated. Um, you know, parents with kids that have comorbidities like asthma and things, likewise, may be really excited about this. Um, other parents, you know, even adults, it's been an interesting time just with the different concerns and questions. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know the exact answer to do this. Um, I think just, you know, if, if you get vaccinated, if your kids get vaccinated, if you have, um, you know, champions in your school that want to promote it, you know, anyone who's getting it to just share the fact that they're getting it. Um, family members, friends, um, personal healthcare providers are usually the ones most likely to change someone's mind. Um, but also, I think with having these extra incentives of, you know, having more freedoms, being able to have the prospect of a more normal school year next year, not having to have tests every week, different things like that may also be a motivator. Um, but if, if you do hear anything from any parents or any students um, as to 
what might help them or what they're missing in terms of information that might help them make decisions, let us know and we will do whatever we can to help with that. Has the 90 day window been extended for vaccinated people to avoid quarantine? So the CDC took that window away um, probably a month or so ago. So if you've been fully vaccinated, there is no expiration date on that at this time. Um, there's a 90 day window only for prior infection. So if you're exposed within 90 days of being infected, you don't have to quarantine. But if you've been exposed two or more weeks after vaccination, regardless of how long it is after your vaccination, you don't have to quarantine. Um, if multiple classes are out on the playground at recess, can they be mask free? The way that I am reading that, if there's a gathering outside that's less than 100 people, then you don't need to mask. That would be, and again, I've just, I've just read these things this morning, getting ready for this, so I haven't had a lot of time to really digest it. But, you know, saying an outdoor gathering of less than 100 people doesn't need to mask. Um, so as long as you have less than 100 kids and adults outside at one time, then they could be mask free. Um, I'm not promising that that's the correct answer because again, I just read that a few hours ago. Do you anticipate graduation guidelines changing given what is going on with the House and Senate voting? I haven't read that proposed bill, so I really don't know. I, I can't really comment on that. Um, I just, and I kind of always come back to my, just because it's allowed doesn't mean it's safe. So I, I just hope we focus on safety too. Um, we did check with Micker. I think that, yeah, Micker is the vaccination registry. Student vaccinations are listed there and the COVID vaccines have been entered. We check on a couple. Yep, so you do have Micker access. That's the same as you check your students required vaccines for school entry. And you can check to see that if they have had the, their um, COVID vaccine as well. So that is a good point. So if you have a student saying, I'm fully vaccinated, I don't need to be tested anymore, you can look it up and confirm that on your on Micker. Then if you're on this call and you don't know what that is, somebody at your school, whether it's your school nurse, your school secretary, somebody is in charge of using that to look up and confirm that your kindergartners and your seventh graders have received their uh, required vaccines. Um, the primary problem with quarantine is that only a fraction or of 1% of folks quarantined from schools ever end up positive. It's not lack of acknowledgement that someone may get sick later in quarantine period, it's that it's so rare. Well, a, a problem with that too is that we don't test everybody that's in quarantine. Um, and there have been studies done, and in some studies it's 30%, 50%, some studies it's 10%, 7%. Um, if they test everybody. So um, with using statistics like that, a lot of the kids that get infected have no symptoms. So we may only know that 1% get sick because that's the ones that actually get sick, but we don't test every single child that's in quarantine. So we really don't know how many of those end up getting sick or positive. So it's a little tricky when we use statistics like that. Do you have a good resource to prove to parents that the vaccine is safe for teens, young adults? We have heard concerns about future fertility issues. So I actually just made um, a recording of a bunch of different questions, kind of trying to address some of those myths. Um, and I don't know, it should end up on our website at some point, but the one about fertility was a myth. I mean, it was, basically just misinformation that was spread, um, stating that the spike protein the vaccine works against um, is similar to a protein that is in the placenta called syncythin. 
Um, and it's completely wrong. I mean, there's four amino acids that they have in common, but it's not enough that you would see the antibodies cross-reacting. And if it were the case, you know, we've had a millions and millions of cases of COVID, we would have expected to see a huge increase in, in female infertility in the last year and a half, and we have not. So, um, so that's that information is widely available on the web on the internet. Um, when this does get approved for younger individuals, likely there will be lots of materials that are coming out from CDC and other places to help with talking to that age population. We just don't have that yet because it's not officially approved yet. So um, it should be coming. But there are, again, there are places where you can go to find those answers. Um, one that I did find was the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia or CHOP. Their vaccination area has um, an area that addresses questions and myths about COVID. So that might be a good place to go if you're looking for something right now. Um, so we appreciate the reduction in 10 days for quarantine with other counties going to three foot close contact tracing in schools and seven days with negative tests to return. Getting more questions from boards of ed about whether we can do the same. Have held the line based on health directive Health Department Directive, but will be difficult to continue unless there is an enforcement mandate from our health departments. Is the 10 day, okay, so, so is it a mandate? So I'll pull up my next <laughs> information I had ready to share, because I know a lot of these questions are coming at you from different areas. Actually, it looks like I was still sharing this whole time. So, um, so the legal issues. So you and we have do have legal authority to exclude students that we think may have a communicable disease. Um, and it's written in different places, but this is just one part of the, these are the communicable disease rules. But then also our health officers are the ones that have the legal authority at the health department. They can write um, orders, to have someone quarantine, um, it can be penalized by a misdemeanor, by imprisonment, by a fine. Um, the, the issue is that, again, we can write orders to people that say you are ordered to be in quarantine. Um, to do that with every single person who needs to be in isolation or quarantine, um, is just very difficult for us to do. But again, it is legally possible for us to do that. Um, if we gave written orders, and we do have some health departments that are doing that, if we did order or provide written orders to everybody um, and somebody said, well, I'm not gonna do this, even if you gave me an order um, and they were not compliant with our order, then we would have to have local law enforcement and prosecutors um, support us to enforce those laws and to get that support and to get a prosecutor to um, you know file and and pass you know to have all that process happen is quite time consuming and typically by the time that happens their quarantine or isolation period is already done so we have relied we haven't done that because of all of that, because it basically is, it's a pain and it doesn't work well at all. So we've relied on the cooperation of the community and everybody else to voluntarily comply with what we're telling them to do um, to stop the spread of COVID. So up to this point, it has been recommendations. We can order it and we can try to enforce it. But again, because of all these issues in the long run, it's, near impossible to enforce it. Just as a reminder, you have the epidemic orders and the guidance for athletes and the Myosha rules that do give you specific orders you must follow uh, for your staff and your, your um, athletes and things. So when people ask you, you know, do I have to do this? Is this a recommendation or an order? At this time, it has been recommendations because to go 
as far as making it an order um, doesn't usually work very well. And we'd rather not have to do that. If you or your school boards choose to do something different than what we do, for us to stop you would take a court order and you know legal action. Um, are we gonna do that? Well, you know, it's case by case basis. Um, if something bad happens because of it, if you know you make quarantine optional, you change to three feet distancing, you go to seven days, and you have a huge outbreak and people get sick and die, et cetera, et cetera. Are you liable? Again, that's something you'll need to be aware of. Um, are we gonna help clean up a mess because of that? You know, it's, it's so again, um, we've, we've counted on working on a good relationship with our community and unfortunately it's, it's kind of falling apart now. So, I think that is the end of the questions. Um, there are some things here that say pe some people don't have access to the chat anymore. I don't know if some have left um, or if something happened with our program, but if anyone has any questions, um, you can either put them in the chat if you can, or feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. By the last slide deck, do you mean from last week? Adele, the one I just showed, uh, we will send that out. We will send this slide deck out um, usually today or tomorrow. And if you are in one of the counties of District Health Department 10, it'll be posted. It won't come to you in the email, but it will get posted on um, the website dhg10.org um, slash coronavirus and then go under the school tab. Um, there are five to six vaccines that are required for school age children. Do you ever see this coming with COVID? Um, not in the near future, but you know, if, and I think it would be very difficult, like we don't require a flu vaccine. Um, so I think it might be really difficult, but you never know. But again, I don't, ex I wouldn't expect it anytime soon. So. Any other questions? I know these next six weeks are probably gonna be tough. So hang in there and we'll just do our best to get through it. All right, and I will send you the slides and the data and you have a good rest of your week.